to the stack. I'm Alex. I'm Justin. I'm Pete. And on the stack, we talk about a bunch of comic books that have come out this week. And we're going to kick it off with Catwoman, Lonely City Number 1 from DC Comics by Cliff Chiang. This is his triumphant return to DC Comics with a black label book all about a older Catwoman. This, in essence, feels like Cliff Chiang's Dark Knight Returns, but for Catwoman. Go ahead, Pete. Okay, first off, he's not just doing the art. He also wrote this. Like this is a <laughs> this is a, a, it's huge a tour de force. Yeah, yeah, this is unbelievable. Like he's done a lot of amazing things. We've been big fans of a lot of his work, but uh, this is the total package here. This is all Cliff. Um, total and, package. And uh, it's fun to kind of see him get to kind of drive his own thing and since he is an artist first like this being art driven i think is such a cool idea and then uh, a great take i think on batman you know we talk about like you know uh you know bad itis or whatever fun pun you did there uh Alex. It's, called, it's, it's actually called uh batigue batigue mm. yeah batigue. but chronic this, batigue it, this mm. feels fresh and new, and it's a it's a cool take, and the I mean the art alone. I mean the art alone. You know what I mean? I mean, come on, the art alone. <laughs> but you were saying, Alex. I'm sorry. Uh, I uh, I like this a lot too. It is sort of the timing's a little odd in that we're getting an older Catwoman over in uh, the Batman Catwoman book that Tom sure, King's sure, doing. Sure, so sure. it feels Don't a little you bit like hold that against Cliff. You fucking uh, I, I'm asshole. not holding it against uh, the story. I like this better. I agree. I like this better too. Um, in it, j- just for from clarity's sake, uh, <laughs> yes, right out the for jump. no other reason. But I also like the fact it, there's a really smart take in here that all of the villains are older. There's a very fun bit with Killer Croc where yeah. he's old man Killer Croc, who's like he's the guy who sits on the curb playing checkers all day, and he's yeah. wearing the same hat and the vest and everything like that. And he's like, oh, my psychiatrist is acting up. Yeah. Very fun. Just fun also, I think it it is hard to pull off in a comic book a character getting old because they, in your mind, or at least in my mind, they move the same way because you're watching them, you're looking at them on a still page, you're filling in the movement there. But what Cliff does really ably is he creates a sense that Catwoman is older. Her joints don't work as well. Her knees yeah. don't work as well. It is harder for her to do these things while she's still trying to do them. And it's great. But, I well, I, oh, the other thing that I wanted to bring up, it's not just like what's going on in Batman Catwoman. There's also, it's a lot like what's going on in Batman because there is a police state based on Batman that's being run by Two-Face here who is now... Yeah supposed to be a good guy and i also think this is doing a better job than that yeah well it's it's definitely a little more uh controlled as an Mm -hmm. idea in this um so yeah i mean i i'm not knocking it by saying it's like what's happening in the other books i'm just saying like it the timing is odd because i do think this book is more unique and more original in sort of its world building so i really appreciate it and the art that cliff does is as always but Excellent. also what's nice you know is- he actually d- he does both the um, <laughs> writing and the art here and thank yeah, you for surpri- out- i'm surprised you didn't mention that pete as but a uh, but justin what's great is when you have an artist kind of leading the way the way the kind of paneling is and the when you kind of like open up the book and kind of just look at it first before we start to read it's really awesome the way it's set up and there's a lot of great flow and movement to the comic it makes it easy to read you can kind of get into the rhythm of it i was just really really impressed with this as a tight package as justin loves you you say that i don't really actually say that you're the one that says that uh this is a great book and just so you guys know i don't think we mentioned this yet but cliff chiang actually (laughs) does the art but he also writes it and i think that's important to know before we wrap up how did we know it's important it's as journalists, we have to make sure we cover the bases. Stop. Yeah. Stop. Nita Hawes Nightmare Blog, number one, from Image Comics, written by Rodney Bottoms. Barnes and Nightmare. Jason Sean Alexander. Art by Patrick Reynolds and Jason Sean Alexander. This is a book where I think the art really leads the way, continuing <laughs> the pattern from the previous book. 
I, I mean, this, the art is really good. This book, I, I like. It felt, I was like, is this an anthology? The way it sort of jumps between the different stories and then it all becomes uh, one thing and it's pretty scary. It's scary as fuck, man. Like, this is a lot. And uh, Pete, you are, are scared. You don't like being scared. You no, like I do not. Movies. There is so a bunch is... of, there was a bunch of moments where I was just like, nope. And I set this book down. Uh, but I did keep going back to it. And that last panel uh, made me jump. Mm -hmm. For joy? No. Uh, <laughs> like, I'm being scared. <laughs> Hooray! Like, yeah, again, what I was saying, I was sort of joking about it a little bit, but I really do think the art leads Ray here because the creatures and the things that are going on are pretty terrifying. And it, like you were saying, Justin, it's a little hard to hold on to the story sometimes, but I always liked look liked looking at what was going on on the page. That last panel was fucking terrifying. Scary stuff. Nubia of the Amazons, number one from DC Comics, written by Stephanie Williams and Vita Ayala, art by Aletha Martinez. This is a big kickoff of Trial of the Amazons, the big crossover that's coming to DC next year. Here we're getting a focus on Nubia, as you can figure out from the title, who I believe in this continuity is essentially picking up from Hippolyta now and becoming queen of yeah. the Amazons. But we're delving into her backstory, how it affects the present day. I'll tell you what, I'm not usually a huge fan of the Themyscira stuff. It feels like it hits a lot of the same notes. This feels fresh and new to me. Well, nice. yeah, and I, I really like the Well of Souls as uh, that's sort of the, the focus here. There's a whole new, the bunch of new Amazons are sort of brought into the fold here, which hasn't happened in a long time. Um, and that's cool. If there's a little bit of air of mystery around what's happening. I definitely feel like something bad is happening, but I feel like we're going to get some good guys, bad guys coming out of this, uh, the well of souls in this moment. So like a lot of nice stuff is set up here in this, um, in this issue. Yeah. Yes, please more. I think this is great. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. There it is. I'm just picturing you going up to the DC offices. and being like, <laughs> <laughs> Yes, please. More. <laughs> Please. More bang, Nubia bang, bang. the Amazons, please. <laughs> May I have more, please? Yeah. More. <laughs> <laughs> this is a very good book. On the other hand, Gunslinger Spawn number one from Image oh, Comics. What is by that supposed to be? I know what it's supposed to be. Here's uh, the thing. Uh, no. <laughs> Justin, hold on, hold on. You finish, you finish. Written by Todd McFarlane, Alice Cott, art by Brett Booth, Thomas Nautchlik, uh, Philip Tan, and Kevin Keane. Kick it off of the triumphant kickoff of King Spawn and the new Spawn line of books. We're getting Gunslinger Spawn, and if you don't know who he is, he has a very big hat. For that, his that's knives. the thing. Where you keep guy, your knives? This guy's supposed to be this absolute badass he's like oh you don't mess with me i'll kill you i'll kill you and he wears the biggest goofiest hat come on I, I maybe i've ever seen like, I mean, like with knives slash slash from guns and roses like he this. looks like that's yosemite it. spawn oh, oh, <laughs> that's, dude, come on. that's hilarious and the fact he's like you want to see something badass kid I keep a very long knife in my very tall hat i'm like what yeah. is this a magic show get out of here gunslinger <laughs> No, no, this is great. Plus, Justin <laughs> always talks about his favorite thing is Spawn. No. And on the last panel, we no, got no. it. And it's there. Oh, but that's the true. Countdown is back, baby. We did get the countdown. Uh, I'll tell you what. I opened up, and for the very first page, I was like, I have no idea what's going on here. <laughs> this is a yeah. bunch of nonsense. And then I flipped to the second page, and I was like, Oh, this is more nonsense. Okay, this is Spawn. And after King Spawn felt like this fresh new take yes. on the Spawn franchise, reading this, I was like, yes, this is this is what Spawn is. Thank you. This is correct, I guess. And do when think, we got to the countdown of the end, I was like, cool. You think Todd McFarlane was like, well, if we're going to do a really good Spawn, I better just put out another bad one, too. Just <laughs> everyone, everyone remembers no, what Spawn has on, been dude, for don't so long. <laughs> But I mean, this hat, this book giant has hat all with the knives inside. It has all the, why are you saying that? Like, uh, that's a, a good thing. It has, it has so much posturing and self seriousness that I feel like that's what I remember Spawn being. And why I was like, I just can't uh, read. Come I can't on, enjoy the that scene anymore. where he loses it. It's like, what is gas? I mean, just great. I mean, that's just fun. 
I just, there's also like, he's barely a gunslinger and they keep, I barely know what a spawn is to start off with. And the no. fact that he's barely a gunslinger is like, this is two things that don't actually map onto anything. But I will say the art is good. I liked a lot of the short stories in the back. I thought they were much stronger than the main story, frankly. Agreed. Um, the last one, especially the art was very nice and it like actually had some uh, gunslinging happening. Yes. Not a lot of gunslinging coming from Gunslinger Spawn. On, Let's move on to a surprising sequel. Ref Just one horses, more thing. One more thing. Horses Just don't run out of gas, guys. Gunslinger yeah. is living it, the best I got life. Newsflash. Everyone knows that. And we have our main <laughs> character being like, what's this contraption for like multiple pages? He's, He's from like, olden times. He doesn't yeah. know what gas is. I know. Why do we have to have him really dwelling on the difference between a horse and a motorcycle? And I'll tell you what, it takes him the whole day to get it. Tell well, you what, I, I I fed a lot of gas to a horse once, and it did not go very far. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, you can drag a horse to gas, but you can't make him mm -hmm. go 55 miles an hour. Uh, yeah, that's the, what I always say. The thing is, the hat, he could easily be wearing a cowboy hat. There's nothing stopping that hat from being a cowboy hat. Instead, no, it's not. Cowboy it's the hats most Abraham Lincolnist <laughs> hat in the world. Abraham like, Lincolnist. It doesn't make any sense. When he is clearly it's a cowboy. A knife hat. But a, it's not a knife. Also, he has uh, 50 bullets covered in bullets and guns and knives. He's could pull his cape. He could pull stuff out of his cape. Why does he keep a knife and a hat? You got to. You got to have no. it. I feel like that was something that he says because he likes, he personally likes the hat. And he's like, yeah. Mm. This hat it looks stupid, but I like it. How can I? <laughs> I have it sound cool? no problem, no problem with Gunslinger Spawn and Medieval Spawn and whatever else all being action figures. That's fine, but bring it to a story and it, it's nonsense. It just becomes nonsense. I'm sorry. Refrigerator full of heads, number one from DC Comics, written by Rio Yours, art by Tom Fowler. This is kicking off on Bucket Full of Heads, the book by Joe Hill that came out. Uh, basket, even, basket, basket. Sorry about that. Um. The same sort of thing. A basket is like yeah. a well, woven if you're bucket. Pick, if you're getting water out of a well, Alex, one of those would be better for it, and <laughs> one will be worse. That's very true. And it's not a refrigerator, I'll tell you what. In this, we're getting a pickup on this axe that keeps heads alive. It goes in the wildest direction possible, and uh, there's a movie I want to reference, a Steven Spielberg movie, but to say it would ruin it, but it goes oh, absolutely yes. insane by the end here. I did not know what to think going into this book, but the fact that there's Tom Fallow art is great, and it's a very different feel from the first series, but I like it so far. What do you guys think? I think that they did a good job in this book of bringing in enough of the elements from the first series. Uh, there's like a big, bad, horrible crime that kicks off the series, and we're going to see um, those criminals, I think, come to this small town and encounter our sort of nice young couple that's just trying to get by. Um, I like that we get to the axe pretty quickly, and then we're just in axe, the wildest version of axe world. Um, so it heightens from the first series. I like this world a lot. I would continue to read uh, anthology series based around this. Uh, I thought it was creepy, but fun and uh, really great art. The Death of Doctor Strange, number two from Marvel, written by Jed sure. McKay, art by Lee Garbett. The cliffhanger in the last issue was that Doctor Strange died. But then he came back. How did he come Classic. back? We find out in this issue exactly what was going down and also find out more about maybe not the people who killed Doctor Strange, but definitely some new, very creepy enemies. Uh, this, uh, Justin, you were talking about this on the live show. Series is very weird, but fun. Yes, it is weird. It, it feels like it's bringing in, it feels like a larger event. Um, and I know it's sort of a small event, um, off to the side of the Marvel Universe, but it feels big. Like we get all the Avengers in here. Um, the way that they've sort of tricked the the Doctor Strange return here on the heels of his death. He he has set aside um, a week of his like life to come back on his death and solve his own murder is just a great premise for anything. I, I uh, hope I can do that one day. Yeah, uh, you're gonna need more than a week to solve your murder. <laughs> nah, that's probably true. So I was I would set aside a month Oof. if you could. Because I'll tell you what, when I do it, it's gonna be really complicated. <laughs> that's what I was gonna say. It's not gonna be a it's gonna take me a month to figure out it was you. <laughs> yeah, but you, you have to solve it. You can't just get. You can't just point to me and be like, "All right, R.I.P. R.I.P." 
Only Murders in the Podcast. That's the show that. I... <laughs> nice, Pete. What did you think about this book? Uh, I I thought it was good. You know, I just I think it was like like a lot of what Justin said. Uh, I thought it was definitely uh, uh, tweaked well and put together in a good way. I, I I thought it read well, so I appreciate it. All right, let's move on and talk about Green Lantern number seven from DC Comics, written by Jeffrey Thorne, art by Tom Rainey and Marco Santucci. Our front story here is following John Stewart as he goes back in time, and we get yet more information about the Guardians and their origin and how it mixes with the New Gods. And the backstory is all about our lanterns, who aren't exactly lanterns as they get in a bunch of scuffs and fights and things like that. <laughs> but uh, I'll tell you what, this is great. We, I was a little iffy about the John Stewart story, but it takes a turn here that is really interesting, I thought. And yeah. I continue to like the Joe Green Lantern story as well. So this is, as I always like to say, a very tight package. Uh, <laughs> this, I agree the John Stewart story was a lot better than the earlier ones and, and the, uh, the Joe as well. This is something, though, I just feel like this book is a little strange. Like, I want them to have more space or to be um, dealing with a larger issue. It feels like the this new sort of take on Green Lantern doesn't really have a premise to it. Um, and maybe that's what they're just like. Let's just tell some stories featuring our uh, different Green Lanterns however we want to. But I'm sort of missing sort of the larger uh, idea of what's happening. Hmm. Pete, what about you? What do you think about this? You're iffy on Green Lantern as always. Yeah. Uh, you know, I thought the backup was better, uh, but it's just tough because you're taking like my favorite new Green Lantern character and trying to fit it into the Green Lantern world, which I didn't like as much. Um, but, um, you know, it's fine if you like Green Lantern. <laughs> Fair enough. Let's turn uh, to one of our favorite books here on the podcast. Ice Cream Man, number 26 oh, from Image oh, Comics, oh. written by W. Maxwell Prince, art by Martin Morazzo. In this issue, you got to turn your comic sideways, oh, buddy. Man. Or you're reading computer. all about a family tree as the main character climbs all the way to the bottom and tries to figure out where the trauma and addiction in his family comes from. Great issue. Very oh. annoying to read on a laptop. but Yeah, it's... I'm glad I'm not in an office where people will be looking at me because I was holding my laptop on its side. But picking up your entire monitor and holding it, <laughs> yeah. walking around the office trying to... Yeah. Um, yeah, people will be like, Pete, that doesn't look like work. Uh, I just think that uh, this is just classic, unbelievable Ice Cream Man. Like, we also got, like, a lot of characters, like, the callback characters in this issue. Just, oh, man, so, so good. Such a good story. Yeah, I mean, this book always just, like, finds new ways to tell, like, stressful uh, stories about people dealing with the things that we deal with in our lives uh, while bringing in sort of the larger mythology of an ice cream man that is um, somehow the devil himself. And uh, I love the way the family tree premise and then just pushing right through it into something else that I thought was... Super well, cool. Yeah. Great issue. Definitely pick this one up in print, though, I would say, if you can, because you're going to have a better reading experience. Next up, Nightwing number 85 from DC Comics, written by Tom Taylor, art by Robbie Rodriguez. This issue also flips things on their head a little bit, but in this case, we're getting a Batgirl Barbara Gordon book instead of a Nightwing book. It's told from her perspective. Justin, by the end of the book, there's some smoochy boochies. They kissing. They kissing. Uh, I mean, I think, um, who is it that says, uh, is it Robin? I think it's right Tim, next yeah. To, and he's like, finally. I'm <laughs> like, yes, Tim, we agree. Um, they, and it's, it's just, this book is so good right now. It's telling stories with Nightwing and bringing in all the relationships that, that Dick Grayson has that are important. And uh, it's just great. They both get hit with the fear toxin and, their greatest fear is losing each other. Instant oh, kiss. Beautiful. On. I have a question. I feel like I missed an issue of Fear State somewhere because who is the seer person? Because I thought Scarecrow took over the Oracle network. And so Scarecrow was pretending to be Oracle. But I, I clearly missed something somewhere because now we have this new villain named Seer who is also doing the same thing. 
Well, I don't think Scarecrow took over. Someone took over, and now we've revealed who, that it's this character. Okay, Caesar. okay. Um, and that was because there's this issue, and there's the um, backup in Batman, which is called Batgirls, mm-hmm. uh, that we'll probably talk about in a minute. That is sort of telling two little portions of this story. Um, and uh, yeah, I, I like it. I like Oracle just wrecking shop and maybe entering the Batgirl fray uh, yet again. Yep, Pete. Yeah, I agree. It's it's super touching. Um, so it was kind of nice to get to that moment. Uh, great art. Next up, Thor number 18 from Marvel, written by Donnie Cates, art by Pascal Ferry and Bob Finn. In this issue, Thor goes to the only person who can help him with his Mjolnir problem, and yes. that, of course, is Throg. And Throg has no choice but to av- assemble the pet Avengers. Great stuff. They are just called the Avengers. Oh, yeah, right, Alex. I'm sorry. How dare you? Yeah. I apologize. Still, great stuff. Love the Throg here. Very fun Throg in this issue. It takes a big problem and uh, makes it kind of ridiculous but fun at the same time. Good book. Well, I love how Throg's a badass. He's like, um, listen, I started this project four days ago before you even came to me. <laughs> That's kind of, I'm a for, very forward-thinking frog uh, all the power of Kermit the Frog and organizational skills mm-hmm. uh, with the power of a little chip of Uru that he's built into a tiny hammer. Hmm. Pete, you s- pumped your fist in uh, celebration this, over this? Yeah, I mean, come on. We're taking the, you know, we got teased in the Marvel show with Frog, Throg, and now we're just cashing in on that, on that kind of tease there. And I think it's just so great and needed. You know what I mean? Like enough of this Thor guy. Like really, let's get to the to the real hero. I like that Throg. he's in. A, he has to get into the tiny frog house. But here's uh, Throg. I I see it a little bit. Shouldn't his name be Thorg? Oh, don't be that guy. No, it's Frog. Throg. Yeah, I know, but it just doesn't sound. Thog. Right. There should be no. That would make now. more sense. Yeah. Yes. It's not as fun. That's why I think Thorg is better. It's not. I don't know. Bruce Wayne may appear to be a wealthy playboy, but beneath this facade, his true identity is that of the Batman, waging an endless war against crime. Join the Cape Crusader and Batman The Audio Adventures, the first scripted audio original featuring Batman and his villainous rogues gallery in a world premiere story of life and death in Gotham City, debuting exclusively on HBO Max. Starring Jeffrey Wright as Batman and a who's who of incredible Saturday Night Live alums, this rollicking adventure told across 10 episodes is written and directed by Emmy winner Dennis McNicholas, includes devilishly delightful original music by Doug Bossy, and performances by Rosario Dawson, John Leguizamo, Chris Parnell, Melissa Villasenor, Seth Meyers, Jason Sudeikis, Brooke Shields, Fred Armisen, and many, many more. Go to hbomax.com slash Batman Audio Adventures for more and stream Batman the Audio Adventures only on HBO Max. I don't know. Great question. Great question. Batman number 115 from DC <laughs> Comics, written by James Town of the Fourth, Becky Clunan, and Michael W. Conrad. Art by Bengal and Jorge Jimenez and Jorge Corona. The front story, as we, well, the back story, as we always mentioned, is the beginning of this Batgirls crossover mini story whatever it is tying into fear state but the front we're getting batman and miracle molly uh trying to fight back against scarecrow while a bunch of other stuff is going on with ivy and the magistrate and simon saint lots of stuff going on in the crossover now this feels like i'll say to make pete not upset a very much a middle chapter but uh but yeah lots of stuff going on i don't know yeah, I maybe I, I'm just okay with this crossover at this point. Yeah, hey, do you I not th- like it? I don't know. I there's something about it with it felt very focused, and I think it was just this week that adding in Seer and the stuff with Simon Sade focusing on Ivy and Scarecrow off doing all this stuff. There's just too many things going on, and it's starting to feel a little unfocused. I I feel confident giving the storytellers involved that it's going to come back to the central point and it's going to come back to Batman versus Scarecrow and we're ultimately going to see what the plan is there so that's fine but right now I'm just I'm not sure what it's about and again yeah, I, that's just this week 
yeah, I think I agree. Like, just this issue was a little bit of a, a letdown because we spent so much time with Saint. Uh, I did like the Molly stuff. I thought that was cool. Um, but I feel She's like... cool. Yeah, I really... I think I think we're going to get some more great things to come. Uh, I like this issue a lot. I think this is this is a big story that I feel like is very meticulously planned out. And I really like the um, the way Scarecrow is sort of building this Peacekeeper character um, in, in a cool way, in a scary way. And uh, the Ivy stuff, I, I like that as well. It does feel like sort of two things happening at once, but I do think they are going to become important to each other. And the art in this issue I thought was beautiful. There's a uh, the pay, page 13, I think, with Batman shooting a grappling hook and miracle molly on her like uh fan platform or whatever is just such a cool shot yeah Yeah, i mean i assume the plan here is scarecrow put simon saint in a position where he'd find out about ivy that would push ivy too hard so that she'll bring down all of gotham city and that ultimately will be the climactic event that causes his fear state that causes the evolution of Gotham city the way, the way he wants it. But again, I feel like we're in the middle chapter there and we either need to see something like that happen or whatever the plan is come together. But let's move on to something else. Made in Korea. Number five from image comics written by Jeremy Holt art by George Shaw. This is one of the best, one of the most upsetting books on the stand yeah. right now about a young AI who is learning violence, learning hatred, but also grappling with gender identity in this issue. Uh, The AI creature, robot, whatever you want to call her, is taken back to Korea in this issue by her maker and discovering things there. Things go very poorly, but I love the discussion of like being trapped in your own body and what that means and what it means if you want a different body that they deal with in a relatively subtle and understated way here that I thought was so smart. Yeah, this book I feel like is just bringing in so many ideas in like a very subtle way. Uh, I, I think we get to enjoy the dread of like what can happen with this uh, this AI over the course of like the few scenes we get here. Uh, it, it's really good. One of the most unique books out there, I think. Yeah, I agree. It's it it's it's doing a lot of great things smartly, which is nice. Is dealing with a lot of different issues, and the art is unbelievable. The storytelling is great. It's very moving, um, and uh, yeah, I've been impressed with the choices that it's making. It's one of my, uh, you know, when we get it in the stack, I always really look forward to uh, what's going to be in there because each issue has been really surprising and interesting. Next up, Batman vs. Big B, A Wolf in Gotham, number two, from DC Comics, written by Bill Willingham, art by Brian Level. In this issue, Batman and Big B finally meet face-to-face. They kind of fought a little bit the last issue, but here they're more on even keel. We get a little more information about where Big B is in his life, uh, presumably since Fables. Um, I'll tell you what. I like the story. I think Bill Willingham, not surprisingly, is doing a better job writing Big B than Batman and has ultimately kind of depowered Batman a little bit to make Big B have the upper hand. What do you mean depowered Batman? I mean, like, made Batman, like, a, a step or two behind. Well, he's dealing with a, a storybook character. So I think Batman's <laughs> Batman's maybe not on top of that uh, from the jump. Exactly. I don't I blame plan for Batman. every eventuality. Oh, I know what you are. You're the big bad wolf. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh no, you're clearly the big bad wolf. Okay. <laughs> well, I, I will say, in the in, I think just Bigby is very powerful. Like. Rex the Batcave. I've never seen the Batcave wrecked like this. Yeah, in that any was Batman crazy. Story, which is cool. And it's funny, I feel like this is like the opposite of what you're getting in the main Batman book, Alex, where it's like wildly complicated and convoluted. This is sort of like very different a Batman story, a very different Batman story just coming through. We get all this Robin stuff, egg, like all these like big, weird Batman world ideas that I think are really fun. Uh, and I'm curious... It's weird that this is like the big confrontation between Batman and Bigby. 
And then they're like, well, we're not going to fight now. <laughs> and he's like, well, you, now you have to work together now. Well, you're going to fight later? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Let's work together and then fight Yeah, is the pattern that we're going to go through. Yeah, no, that's what it's, it's just, an, that yeah, was yeah. sort of an odd. I like how Bigby's like, I can smell you. And Batman later's like, uh, I can smell you. <laughs> <laughs> this is what I'm saying. He makes Batman, but Batman kind of, doesn't have the power to smell. I know. I'm saying he makes Batman kind of dumb. Like he's, I don't know. I don't know. Pete. Wow. All right. So I, I'm very much enjoying the continuation of this kind of start. I think that they're making cool <laughs> From the sure. first issue to the mm-hmm. second issue, I'm enjoying yeah. like the arc of this and how it's going because sometimes like in between issues it can get a little kind of like well, what's going on. So I'm yeah. appreciating that and also like art is just phenomenal and uh, you know Willingham he knows how to write so I'm enjoying it. I feel like Alex the, Batman's your dad and you <laughs> saw him like get yelled at at work and you're like. My dad was not very powerful at work today when I saw him. He couldn't do the papers. Who, like was, he that, does. who was that man who was mean to my dad? Yeah. I thought my like, dad uh, was... It's the big bad wolf. It's the big bad wolf. Uh, <laughs> no, no. My dad is the strongest uh, yeah, guy. I my dad was the most powerful. No, my dad is the strongest guy. So yeah. that guy must be the big bad wolf. That's the only way that'll work. Um, the United works. States of Captain America, number five from Marvel, written by Christopher Cantwell, art by Dale Eaglesham. This is finishing up this title, as it turns out, as Captain America, Captain America's. What Captain's we America. Captain's America is what we established in the book. All take on uh, the big bad of the series. Mm-hmm. The standout here for me is Dale Eaglesham's art. It was just perfect to draw Captain America. Uh, great stuff. Great to see um, Bucky in the cap uniform again here, which I thought, I was like, ah, man, it really took me back to when Bucky was cap and how fun that was. Yeah. Um, and boy, do you get a lot of captains here. It's it's almost too much captain. I'm over captained with this. I did like the Bucky yeah. stuff. Um, Would you say you were over captainated? <laughs> I was. I was. <laughs> yeah. Captain Crunch America, Captain Morgan America pops mm-hmm. in for a quick minute. Anyway, this is a good title. I'm very interested to see they plug that there's going to be a Captain America Iron Man team up book coming next, yeah. which I don't think I've ever seen before. So yeah. it very much feels like. Marvel's world's finest, mm-hmm. uh, which is cool. Uh, I'm down for that. But it also made it feel like this is the main Cap book. Yeah. If you want to just read Cap, you have to read this Cap and Iron Man book. So Weird stuff. Speaking of team-ups, let's talk about Batman Catwoman number eight from DC yes. Comics, written by Tom King, art by Liam Sharp. This is continuing a lot of stuff happening. <laughs> what? Ooh. Dude, what? Yeah. Well, so I'll tell you what. I know I've said this a couple of times that I don't want to repeat myself, but I feel like the dreamlike quality of what's happening here as we jump through multiple timelines is a little hard to follow. But as bummed as I was that they weren't keeping with Clay Man because it felt like it was Tom King and Clay Man together, yeah. Liam Sharp is better. Like, I, the Liam Sharp issues, the last one and this one, are much easier to follow, much more direct. I still don't know what the Phantasm is doing here or how the Phantasm is exactly involved in that story, but very good. Just really, really good art in this issue. I Yeah, I thought this was really intense. I love the talking out the relationship here while fighting on rooftops and alleyways. Just classic cat and bat stuff here. Um uh, yeah, I was happy to see kind of Catwoman put it out there for Batman. You know, like have him hear his shit, you know, and deal with it. So, um, yeah, I really have been loving this this kind of story, and Tom King is killing it. So I can't wait for more. I think with uh, with some of Tom King's stuff, because across the board, sort of like, and I like the the way there. There's just a lot like, of like you just I like. like across the board. Just you kind of like. like it. No, I like it a lot. Um, okay, well then say that. Don't just say uh, across the board. It's eh. oh, oh, the like police are here. I hope yeah. I'm being arrested by the like police. Um, but I think in this book, because of the multiple timelines, it, it's starting to feel like all the Batman and Catwoman stuff on the roof talking about their relationship. I'm like, we've been doing this for a million years, 
when if you did it sort of all at once and we could do it and then move on to the next thing and i get no, the we, idea we of don't want to move on we want to but stay here i want to move on to a different type of storytelling i think because nope. i think this is like i get the juxtaposition but to alex's point we've sort of lost a little bit about what each thread is sort of the thrust of each thread it just feels like we're seeing different things happening at different times to slightly different people uh so i, I agree it is a it's starting to lose a little bit of its cohesion um but i to the, the the liam sharp art makes this feel like a book from like the 80s like early mm -hmm. sandman almost and it's adding this whole level of dread to it that is is really cool yes um, that is exactly what i've been hooking into about it and i my thought while reading this issue was like, oh, this is like a Vertigo book. This is like yeah. reading a dreamlike, weird Vertigo book versus a DC comic book from the modern era. And that just made it crisp in so much more because I started to feel like if I had read this as a Vertigo book in the 80s or the 90s or something like that, I'd be like, cool. I don't know exactly what's going on, but I'm in for the ride. But because it is a modern DC comic book by Tom King and Clay Mann, that has been a barrier for me in a certain way. And I, I know that's a psychological thing about me, but you're absolutely right. I do think there's that context there is important. And again, that's why I think Liam Sharp, even though I like Clay Mann's art, I think Liam Sharp is actually better for this book than Clay Mann was. You don't like put down one artist like that. You know? Come on, dude. I'm not. I, like I said, I think Clay Bat is really good and draws amazing characters. But but I think just to what I was saying earlier, it would have been it made more sense if there was sort of a clean break and it was like Clay Man finished that part of it and now we're moving into Liam Sharp deliberately. But now we're like because it's all these uh, different time periods that we're seeing more of it does feel like sort of a big change because I really mm -hmm. like the Clay Man stuff. I really like this stuff, but it makes the story just less less continuity for the whole the whole piece. Yeah, absolutely. Let's move on, though, and talk about King Spawn, number three, from Image Comics, written by Sean Lewis, art by Javi Fernandez. This is the Spawn that does not wear a ridiculously tall hat. He wears yeah. no hat, in fact, and he is investigating a super-powered serial killer. It ends in a very gross, very terrifying fight by the end of the issue. This continues to be awesome, and this is everything that I wanted of a Spawn book. Yeah, this is a fun, dark, like exploring the idea of Spawn's enemy being himself and his expectations from like the the people of hell and the, the heaven and all that. Um, I will say, reading this, I was like, "Oh, right, his cape it can grab stuff." And I'm yeah, like, his so... cape is it, its own kind of character, man. And I get I think reading this after reading the Gunslinger book, I was like a little like, "Oh yeah, this is so." weird and like sort of has a lot of venom like they even use the word symbiote here and i was like todd mcfarlane doing venom and all that I was just like oh this whole thing started in such a weird magic cape way that i don't think um i is what, not are you cool saying anymore. the cape pulled you out of it i just don't like the cape being it's very like dr strange uh, the but, tone feels off this book is dealing with with serious with stuff the chains the chains are cool chains okay, are great. badass Thank you. Everybody uh, likes chains. But this book is great. Definitely pick this up. Next up, Catwoman. Well, I number... just wanted to say, oh, like, yeah, I, yeah. this is, uh, as the one Spawn fan on this fucking podcast, this is, you know, if, it's nice that you guys are enjoying some Spawn. But, yeah, I mean, just creatively and, like, having kind of, like, a different art direction for Spawn and the creepy kid in the circle was really freaking me out. But I, yeah, I'm just really impressed with this, and uh, it continues to live up to its title. Mm -hmm. Catwoman number 36 from DC Comics, written by Ram V, art by Nina Vakuva and Laura Braga. This is another Fear State tie-in here. Um, yeah, and uh, similar feelings to the other ones. There's just a lot of stuff going on, even though, generally speaking, I like this Catwoman book. What did you guys think? I, uh, I really love the kind of team-up we got to see in this. <laughs> Uh, it was great to see Kat and Harley together. We don't normally see those two together. And Harley's line was hysterical. Like, I want to be her when I grow up. Just really just great. I'm enjoying it. Uh, yeah, it's fun. This definitely feels like it's in its whole other part of this whole deal. Um, except for all the Ivy's. Ivy's still part of it. It is a little sprawling. Um, 
across the board. But I, I'm I like the way the characters are in the Catwoman book now, so I'm excited to see them outside of Fear State. Um, Eat the Rich, number three from Boom Studios, written by Sarah Galley, art by Pius Bach. In this issue, we're continuing the story of this woman who visits her boyfriend's rich family. Turns out they eat the help uh, when they get old enough. And we find out a lot more about the mythology here and exactly what's going on by the end. There's certainly a weird magic thing involved here that I won't necessarily spoil. But this builds and continues to get better every issue. I'm really enjoying this quite a bit, as dark as it is. What about you guys? I agree. I really like this book. I like the way um, the the art is sort of taking some fun twists and turns. There's these great panels where when a big thing happens, we get um, usually the main character's thoughts in big block letters, sort of looking like a classic newsprint, uh, like woman in trouble from like the 1950s. Uh, it it's got a good vibe and it is like you're saying alex taking a bunch of different uh, little twists and turns that i definitely did not expect and telling the story quickly like getting through to the really interesting stuff really great read uh yeah i think it's it's really fucked up um and i really hope you mean are you talking about cannibalism in general uh no i'm talking about the evil rich assholes in this comic oh because it's okay to eat people if nope. you're going to gain their nope. power. No, no, it's not okay for that. All right. Um, yeah, I just, huh. now it's I'm working just. working for me so far. Now I'm just reading this comic to watch all these rich assholes die because it's fucking not cool to root for them. I don't know. Guys. It is and called then, Eat the Rich, but I'm not quite sure what direction it's going in. Yeah, we'll see. <laughs> Instead, I guess we will see. Let's put some money down on it. Pious Box art is absolutely fantastic as well. Let's move on and talk about another one where the art is amazing. Black Manta number two from DC Comics. Yeah! by Chuck Brown. Art by Valentin Delandro. Gotta be honest, I don't exactly know what's going on in this book. There's a lot of different things in a lot of different places. But the art is fantastic throughout. Absolutely fantastic. Pete, you seem to love this, though. Go ahead. Yeah, this is so cool. Really love the idea uh, that we're kind of expressing here of Black Manta, him uh, not, you know, being uh, more complicated than just the villain that he's kind of labeled to be. So really love that. The art's unbelievable. There's got some real uh, heart in this story. I think it's really well done. I'm really enjoying this series. The first issue is great. The second issue is even better. I'm hooked. I love the use of the gentleman ghost in this yeah! uh, issue. Um, yeah, agree with everything that's been said. The art is really good. And um, he's using different corners of the DC universe in fun ways. Um, they uh, There's a, a, a piece of this is uh, something called Orichalcum, which is like this Atlantean metal. And I was like, where do I know that from? And then I was like, I spent weeks playing the Indiana Jones uh, like Mac computer game when I was like uh, in high school. And the part of it is like gathering these little pellets of orichalcum and you have to like put them in all these little different holes in this Atlanta, Atlantis ruins thing. It was so hard and I was <laughs> traumatized by that. Wow. Exciting stuff. That Texas Blood, number 11 from Image Comics, written by Chris Gondon, art by Jacob Phillips. Our second arc is heating up here. As the main character remembers the time he took down a satanic cult, oh, it man. gets very intense in this issue, which I was surprised about. This book is fun. This is one of my favorite reads fun? of the week. It's a fun, like, this, this is book, fun. The story is exciting. Kids with guns is fun. These, these satanic cults that's like. I wish more kids had guns. Go oh ahead, my Pete. God. What the, fuck? <laughs> the no, the, the main characters are really well done, and their relationship, which. You know, we've only known uh, known this the second character. I forget his name off the top of my head, but like we've only known him for like three issues, and it's great. He, I want to see more. And then the back matter, um, they talk about having a spinoff um, of just him, sort of going around chasing up weird uh, occult stories. I'm I'm here for it. It's good stuff. Last but not least, Maw number two from Boob Studios, written by Jude Ellison S. Doyle. 
and art by A.L. Kaplan. We were a little iffy is the wrong word, but uh, confused perhaps about the first mm-hmm. issue, even though the art was good as this woman maybe heads to some sort of magical commune. It wasn't totally clear, but we get a little bit more clarity this issue, as well as some absolutely insane things that happen towards the end here. I'm, I'm in it personally with this issue. I still wow. don't know exactly what's going on, but everything is intriguing enough that I'm curious to follow it into issue three. I agree with that. Like the sort of maybe not twist at the end, but what happens at the end, I was like, Oh, didn't see this coming. Yeah. This is a whole new thing. And I have some questions about it and I'm assuming he'll be answered next issue. Yeah. Yeah. I'm, uh, I'm, I'm still a little bit in the dark on this, but like art's unbelievable. This is creepy as fuck. I'm not sure who I'm rooting for or what's going on, but it's interesting. It's very interesting. Absolutely. I did not, there was no way I could have predicted the end of this. So, I mean, the originality points are off the charts. If you'd like to support our podcast, patreon.com slash comic book club. Also, we do a live show every Tuesday night at 7. We sure do. Podcast at YouTube. Come hang out. We'd love to chat with you about comic books. iTunes, Android, Spotify, Stitcher, or the app of your choice to subscribe, listen, and follow the show. iTunes, Android, Spotify, Stitcher, or the... I just said that, didn't I? At Comic Book Live. <laughs> at you Twitter. stopped yourself. It's important to get it out there. You got to get the news. <laughs> ComicBookClubLive.com for this podcast and many more. Until next time, we'll see you at the Virtual Comic Book Show. Yeah. Oh, uh, we should say that um, Cliff uh, Chang does both. Uh, he both writes and draws uh, the issue. I just want to get that. Pretty in amazing. Thanks it's... for remembering that. 